Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. What a pleasure it is to be here with you in Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, and a great, great pleasure to be here at the Clinton School. I can uh, say that it was uh, one of the high points uh, of uh, recent memory to be here for the opening of the, uh, of the library. Uh, what a magnificent building it is and what a privilege it is to come speak here at this uh, school. I gather my brother has beat me to it. Uh, but I look forward to talking to you tonight, not about presidential politics, but about uh, uh, energy security. Uh, there's so many uh, opportunities to uh, ponder these issues, but rarely today uh, in society do we think about the combination of national security with energy policy as well. Uh, I like to connect dots over history, and I should say that this is another treat for being here because this very piece of land demonstrates uh, the, the past and the present brought together uh, in a very special focus. Uh, so tonight I hope you'll uh, forgive me if I uh, veer off a little bit into the past and reflect on the fact that this year we're marking the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II. This was a huge transformational uh, moment of the, 21st, or of the 20th century. Of course, the, uh, the First World War was a war that changed things fundamentally. World War II was the war that speeded them up. Uh, at the end of World War II, uh, many, many things changed. There was a revolution that uh, spread across the globe, the beginning of a Cold War. Uh, but as I reflect on World War II, I can't help remarking, actually, at this very time frame, uh, the Battle of the Bulge, uh, the 70th anniversary of the Battle of the Bulge, which is, by the way, the largest American battle in our history, uh, was drawing to a close just about now. I mention this because few people realize that the Battle of the Bulge had a transformational impact on the United States of America. It was at this time, uh, at the very end of the war, uh, after D-Day, of course, uh, Allied troops were making their way towards the heart of Germany. And during this period, Hitler threw everything he had uh, at the Allied forces in an attempt to regain his foothold uh, in the West. At this time, the bulge, of course, uh, described that 60-mile wide and deep bulge into Allied lines. Well, the reason I say that it had an impact eventually on the future of this country is that Eisenhower rapidly realized uh, that the way to turn this battle around was to gain control over the German Audubon. This was uh, a very, it was a marvel of highway construction. Uh, it was a four-lane highway, two, two lanes in each direction with overpasses, something that this country had actually never seen before. Uh, and um, Ike remembered uh, his drive across the country with his army colleagues uh, to go from one part of the United States to the other. Uh, you might be interested to know that in 1919 when he did that, it took uh, from uh, mid-July to Labor Day uh, to get across the United States of America. The road system was a patchwork of uh, old roads you know, roads that had started out as Indian trails that had then been turned into dirt roads that were eventually paved, uh, but it was a patchwork of small roads that connected small towns. Uh, so control over the Audubon, turns out in this battle, was absolutely pivotal. Because uh, the Germans had made this attack during very cloudy weather in Central Europe, uh, and this meant that the Air Force uh, was limited in the bombing it could undertake, um, and much of the transportation lines, uh, such as trains, were stymied from coming into play. Because of the Allies managed to control the Audubon, in, uh, in the course of this battle, they managed to move 250,000 troops, American troops, uh, to finally bring about uh, the, uh, the breakthrough there at the Battle of the Bulge. That would be the breakthrough of capturing Bastogne. But let me tell you, that battle, as a matter of fact, you may be interested to know that African-American troops played a pivotal role in that victory that also spurred Eisenhower's interest and commitment to civil rights. Uh, in any case, the president came back, A, determined to do something about civil rights, and B, determined that we should have an Audubon of our own. Uh, thus, uh, the 
the great push in the 1950s to establish an um, interstate highway system uh, was born on the bloody battlefield of, of uh, Belgium and Luxembourg. So you know, sometimes you don't know where um, important impetus for change comes from. I should also add, I'm here in Little Rock, Arkansas. Before I leave the Battle of the Bulge, I should say it was the 101st Airborne Division that not only did D-Day, the 101st Airborne Division uh, liberated Bastogne and went on to play a very important part in the history here at, in Little Rock. In any case, uh, the post-war period was one of enormous change, and I think it's, we're beginning to understand fully that every war brings with it massive technological change because things are discovered in a way during wartime and on a time scale uh, that really has a revolutionary effect. But there was more uh, transformational change than, than just uh, technology that came out of the war or ideas to create an interstate highway system. The atomic bomb <clears throat> um, made its debut at the end of the war in ways that transformed uh, the rest of that century. Computers uh, began to um, be commonplace in scientific work and eventually in industry. And of course, all of these changes, including the GI Bill, brought about the rise of the middle class. Uh, there's so much more you could say about that transformational change, but you could say the technology and geopolitical change abroad made it one of the most important transformational times. Uh, I would submit um, that we are in a transformational time today. Many of the factors are the same, rapid technological change, geopolitical change that is both the result of um, and also an impetus for this change. Uh, we're also living in a time that's rather similar in that we're in a budget constrained period of time. Uh, the 1950s were actually very austere times. We managed to modernize our country, even though I'm proud to say the President of the United States was balancing the federal budget. Uh, in any case, it was not a time when money was uh, growing on trees, when um, unwise choices could be made without a second thought. Uh, and so I think it's worthwhile to look back to the World War II period, uh, the post-war period, and to reflect on where we are today. Uh, you know, I, I live in Washington. Of course, there's so many wonderful Washington jokes, I, I'm slightly tempted to tell a few of them. I think that we could say in a dignified manner, however, it was our uh, current president who noted that Washington is the place where good ideas go to die. Um, I wonder how he's feeling about that now since uh, Washington has been, you know, not the happiest, happiest of places over um, the last number of years. Uh, we're in a period, because of constrained financial times, uh, that the city's um, in a, a state of immobility in a way. People don't know how to operate uh, in making things happen when there isn't sort of money to make it easier. Um, and so um, I think it's worthwhile to look back at the past, but much more importantly to link the past with our future challenges. Uh, I don't know about you, but I thought it was a hello moment uh, when the Chinese economy overtook the United States as the largest economy in the world last year. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, I regard that as a call to action. In addition to that, I think we can easily look at uh, the geopolitical situation uh, in the Middle East, uh, in the former Soviet Union, which is an area I know quite well, uh, and in other uh, parts of the world, to see that in some way we are being challenged in our role as global leaders. Um, and so, again, forgive me, I have to reflect back on the past um, and think about this the way perhaps my great mentor, uh, General Andrew J. Goodpaster, would think about it. Goodpaster was one of these amazing uh, American generals. He had an advanced degree from Princeton in addition to wearing four stars. Uh, by the time we shared uh, office space together, we had offices next to each other for five years. Uh, he was in retirement, but one of the great elder statesmen in Washington. Here was a guy who had worked for George Marshall, chief of staff of the Army during World War II, and was the day-to-day -day national security uh, person for Dwight Eisenhower in the 1950s. He once said something to me that I thought was so profound, I'd like to share it with you this evening. You know, he'd come in in the morning and he would scratch his head and he'd say, you know, this really isn't serious. Not serious, it was a real indictment coming from General Goodpaster, I can tell you. But what he was worried about 
and he described it for me, was that we were thinking about all the small issues, but ignoring the issues that were most important for our long-term uh, peace and prosperity. And he likened, he, he offered me uh, a way to visualize the problem as a strategist that I've never forgotten. He said, Susan, think about um, the challenges facing this country. Think of the United States as a tent. Now think about which poles hold up the tent and which poles don't hold up the tent, the small poles at the edge of the tent. Now he says, if one of those tall poles, long poles, falls down, the whole tent is undermined. Well, this is a wonderful way of visualizing how a military man with extraordinary responsibility, uh, not only uh, during the Cold War, but afterwards, uh, thought about how to strategize um, a sense of priority in our public thinking. So, believe it or not, this is what eventually drew me to the energy field. I know you were wondering when I was going to get there, but it happened to me one day, and I can remember the day very clearly. I'd been working on arms control. As a matter of fact, I'm one of the few Westerners who ever got inside the third perimeter fence at Russia's number one top secret nuclear weapons facility. I was there for the Department of Energy, and I must say, after that experience, I thought, you know what? This is so exciting, I think I can retire. <laughs> um, I don't know how you can top that, actually. <laughs> um, or you could think, wow, this is really ground zero. That's um, <laughs> potentially ground zero. But anyway, um, about 2003, I was ready to find a segue out of that. I was already working in the nuclear energy field to some degree. Did you know, by the way, that uh, for um, from the early 1990s until just last year, uh, we blended down Soviet-era warheads and used that in nuclear reactors and produced electricity. Did you know that up until this last year, one in every 10 light bulbs was, was electrified by a Soviet-era warhead? Pretty exciting. So that was my segue into the electricity sector. But I was sure I was on the right track when on October 14th, 2003, I was in a hotel in New York City. I said uh, to somebody today that it was the 14th floor. I am incorrect about that. I checked my notes, it was the 23rd floor. All I know is you don't wanna have to walk up and down the back stairs uh, that far up. But sure enough, around five o'clock in the afternoon, I was just getting ready to go out to uh, meet with some colleagues of mine. Somebody came running down the hallway, banging on all the doors, were evacuating the building. And in no time at all, there were hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers in the street. And I'm with my national security hat on thinking, this is really a bad idea. You know, if it's a chemical attack, you need to stay inside. If it's a radiological attack, you need to stay inside. Um, not really smart to put everybody out on the streets, but uh, it became clear pretty much right away that it really wasn't a terrorist attack, so we all sighed a sigh of relief. Actually, there was a little bit of a street party going on. A few bars opened up. There were a lot of people making friends with total strangers, a lot of drinking going on, and then it got dark. No lights, no way to get back to your hotel. Oh my, have you ever been in New York City without any lights? Having to walk blocks and blocks and blocks to your hotel, that was tricky. In any case, that was the fun part. The next day wasn't fun at all. There was no water. There was no gasoline, because it requires electricity to pump gasoline, uh, which means that there was no way out of the city. Um, a few scalpers came in from, I don't think they drove across the country to get there and make lots of money, but uh, you couldn't get out of city without having $500 in cash, but guess what, the ATMs didn't work. And then it started getting scary. Food that was being exorbitantly priced the day before turned into giveaways because there was no refrigeration. Uh, and I'm not exactly sure the official time frame for how long this crisis went on, uh, but certainly when they did the assessment, 500 million, or I'm sorry, 50 million uh, customers across the Midwest and on the Eastern Seaboard and up into Ontario uh, actually lost power. Uh, the cost of the economy at that time was about $10 billion. That's in 2003 numbers, so you can up that significantly now. Uh, so uh, while this massive disruption uh, related, you might be interested, it related to congestion uh, on the electricity grid. 
and uh, the, the, the wires that carried the electrons uh, sagged because of this congestion. A lot of demand in the East Coast because it was the summertime and it was hot. And the sagging wires hit a tree or some vegetation and boom, it was out. Wow. Uh, that is when my new career was born. <laughs> I thought after this experience uh, that since I was already in the electricity sector in the nuclear area, uh, that it would be really interesting to start looking at the impact of the electricity grid uh, on the future of this country. And what a surprise it was for me to discover that rather like those roads before the end of World War II that were cobbled together from, you know, paved, uh, paved dirt roads that had really come from Indian trails. Uh, our um, national grid was really uh, cobbled together from, from uh, Edison's time uh, up until now, uh, put together uh, and enlarged over time. And I realized then that actually I just wasn't thinking about national security the right way. Uh, even though I'd spent uh, 25 years of my career going back and forth to the Soviet Union and then Russia, I was competent, you know, in the areas I described for you, I suddenly realized that actually national security just isn't about arms control, uh, and it isn't about uh, diplomacy necessarily. It's not uh, about our military strategy. And then I started doing some reading, and lo and behold, my grandfather's voice came to me again. And there he is saying in 1953 that there are three pillars of national security. One, our military capability. Two, our economic health. And three, our moral authority in the world. And, um, and then I started thinking about those long poles in the tent. General Goodpasture was correct that energy is a long pole in the tent. Uh, as demonstrated uh, not only then, but is increasingly demonstrated to us now. Uh, so I had this opportunity on uh, August 14th to see this three-legged stool, and I was reminded of the critical nature of electricity as the backbone of our nation's security. Now, I know it was said earlier that I have a group of students at Gettysburg College. I do indeed. Uh, the title of my uh, seminar is Strategy and Leadership in Transformational Times, and the students and I have uh, studied the energy sector. They will tell you I'm obsessed. I'm obsessed about strategy, I'll give you that, but you know, not the short-term strategy. Everybody on TV is a strategist, have you noticed that? Um, I'm interested in the strategy that has to be devised when you think about long-term capability uh, in combination with uh, changing uh, environments. Uh, I'm thinking about the strategy you have to put together to get something done when the timelines far exceed any one election cycle or any financial reporting period. Now that's hard. That's hard because it requires bringing about a bipartisan consensus and it requires enough national education actually to convince uh, ordinary Americans that this is something that transcends uh, the political environment in which we're living. Um, and so um, I must say that we are in a, not only um, is our country and the world in a, a period of transformational change, but the energy sector alone is in the, in the middle of a revolution. Uh, and I think most Americans don't understand that. Um, another reason why I'm delighted to be here this evening to talk to you about the complexities that are out there. And without getting too much into the weeds, let me just say that, of course, we're grappling uh, with the issue of climate change geopolitics. Now we realize that how closely tied geopolitics are to oil and gas. Uh, we knew it uh, when actually we were importing all of this oil and gas. Now the situation is beginning to reverse. What are the long-term implications of that going to be? Um, and then we have, uh, we have regulatory uncertainty. We have investor uncertainty. Um, and we have to move actually from what one think tank called the Edison era into uh, the Google era in electricity. Uh, energy is indeed in the middle of this transformation. Um, and there are um, a number of factors that each of these items I just mentioned, uh, how they impact um, the electricity sector. Climate change itself um, has brought about 
uh, the sever severity of storms. I think we all know that. You don't have to get into a big debate about who's causing climate change, whether it's us or whether it's just you know, part of some kind of fluctuations. Mercifully, we don't have to have that debate uh, to acknowledge that uh, storms are getting considerably more um, uh, impactful. And uh, systems are actually um, not capable of responding or um, uh, demonstrating resilience that's required um, after uh, many of these damaging storms. I know in the Washington area, we're routinely hearing of people being without electricity for a week at a time. Uh, during some of these bad storms. Um, weather is the number one uh, cause of electricity failure, and it costs the economy between 18 and $33 billion every year uh, due to uh, lost wages, spoiled inventory, and all the things that I experienced uh, while I was in New York on that fateful day. Uh, also, we've got uh, all of this turmoil in the, the policy area, and I'm not saying turmoil in a negative way. It's just that there's so many changes and all the changes are interrelated that it's hard to know how it's going to shake out. Policy changes have uh, affected uh, the way we generate electricity, for instance. We are moving away from coal in this country to natural gas, but at the same time we have renewable portfolio standards around the country that mandate a certain percentage uh, of use of um, renewable energy. Uh, all that is uh, a very uh, worthy goal, and it's a very worthy proposition. The problem is, in many parts of the country, there's no way to get the energy created by renewables into the national grid. So trans transmission is going to be absolutely required if we are going to make the use of renewable energy a reality. Um, and this re represents uh, a significant challenge to the energy industry. Uh, MIT, in one of its studies, said that more transmission is vitally needed to bring those resources to the consumer. But since these forms of power are variable and imperfectly uh, predictable, it makes it harder for system operators to match generation with load at every instant. In other words, if you have uh, intermittent sources of energy coming on and off the grid, the wind blows, it dies down, it blows, it dies down, and this is not a regular um, a source of energy coming into the grid at any one time. The grid has to adapt to that. Now just imagine the kind of flexibility that takes um, in, a, uh, in a system uh, that was um, created over the period of more than 100 years, a lot of it not being modern at all. Um, finding the best locations for new transmission requires, will require a streamlined process, siting regimes that can enable this expansion, and a lot more cooperation at all levels of the regulatory process. But as we know, we have a, um, a vital democracy. Uh, we also need to add to that much more interaction uh, with the public. But again, public education becomes one of the linchpins of that particular process. And then we have the shift um, uh, at the same time uh, towards renewables in a way even uh, the gas industry has even affected nuclear power in this country. I'm a great advocate of nuclear power. It's been one of the very safest ways to generate electricity in this country, but because of the low price of natural gas, we are closing perfectly good nuclear power plants in this country that still have uh, a lengthy period of time that they can operate. This is, I'd like to emphasize, the only form of baseload carbon-free electrical generation. So where's the strategy for that one? Finally, the third thing that is changing everything, even if all you have to do is pick up the paper, is this period we call the age of terrorism. Uh, and of course, as you well know here uh, in Arkansas, there are threats both to the physical security of the grid, and now there is increasingly concern um, about the fate uh, of um, the electricity grid um, with respect to cybersecurity. Uh, I know there was a number of recent attacks in central Arkansas on the uh, physical security. Uh, that may well be uh, a question of hardening sites locally. It's the cyber area that's really got um, national security experts in Washington concerned. Uh, because so much of it um, is, is unknown, so much of it is anonymous. Uh, even state actors who involve in cyber attacks 
uh, often use uh, individuals uh, who are not directly tied to them. It's a clandestine world that is very hard, uh, hard to assess. Uh, and add to that the assets, that is the national grid, are owned privately, and yet it's the federal government that monitors the threats. And so you have a major challenge uh, for public-private partnerships in terms of uh, identifying the threats and remediating them. Uh, quote, the secure and reliable delivery of uh, electricity is a vital cornerstone of modern American uh, society, uh, said the Center for the Study of the Presidency in Congress. For those who seek to do our nation significant physical, economic, and psychological harm, the electric grid is an obvious target. In addition to malicious actors, the grid regularly faces the challenge of extreme weather, uh, but the report went on to say that cybersecurity is the area that needs uh, special attention. Uh, I would add, while we're reflecting on World War II, that it has been noted that after the war was over and the military did its uh, assessment of the, uh, the conduct of the war, uh, strategic uh, bombing uh, divisions did note that had they uh, targeted the electricity grids of Japan and Germany, it might have expedited things. Uh, if they were understanding the importance of the, uh, the grid in, 1940, in the 1940s and then again in 46 when they were assessing that, uh, surely it has not been lost on others who are thinking about ways uh, to hurt this country. In any case, as you can see, um, there are many, many moving parts to the energy picture. Um, and I just want to leave you with one thought today. First of all, do be thinking about the long poles in the tent. Uh, when you watch television especially, you'll wonder why um, none of them are ever mentioned. And the newspaper does a better job, but not uh, a fully adequate one in my view. But I think maybe the most important thing I want to leave you with is that the electricity grid is the backbone of our energy infrastructure. Uh, and it is the longest pole in the tent. And so when we think about it, it isn't enough just to think that it would be um, helpful uh, to modernize our grid. You sure would be helpful, because if this state or any other state in the Union is going to continue to expand, we have to have uh, the capacity uh, to bring electricity to those areas. And with the uh, shale gas revolution, there's a real promise of manufacturing coming back to this country in a big way. So we will need to modernize for that reason, just as we needed an interstate highway uh, for the movement of goods and services uh, along America's roadways. But think of this now as a national security issue, because national security is about the health of our economy. At the same time, um, it revolves around the physical uh, security of our country itself. If we think about energy as a national security issue, maybe we're going to elevate this into a serious dialogue in our country about how we're not only going to plan regionally, which is absolutely critical, for our energy future, but we're going to have to begin to look at a coherent national way of addressing this issue. Uh, let me just close by saying that um, this is going to be absolutely critical to sustain our way of life. People died on battlefields and foreign lands so that we could continue to enjoy the American way of life. Uh, we have something we can do about it here at home, uh, and I have outlined those reasons. Uh, the energy infrastructure of this country offers magnificent opportunities for national betterment, and it holds the key to our future security. It would not be a cliche to say this is going to require leadership at all levels. Not only local leadership, but it's really going to require some kind of leadership coming from uh, our national uh, politicians and public servants. Uh, this is something uh, that we all long for, a kind of leadership that is more strategic uh, in its view. Uh, but we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity every day to make sure that we are leaving a lasting contribution uh, to the rising generations. Thank you for this opportunity. <laughs>
the elect what you're referencing and second how could that help like with the colorado river and the problems that the river is having because of how much it had been used by city southwest well, I hope you'll forgive me if I don't address the Colorado River just because I'm, I'm one of these Washingtonians who doesn't like to talk about things I don't know very much about. Uh, that sometimes makes me a little unusual uh, there, but uh, I'd like to get back on safer ground. Now, remember, I've spent most of my time in the electricity sector. But I, uh, so anyway, with respect to natural gas, it's very clear that there is a market, um, and so the uh, um, uh, supply and demand is going to have an impact on the price, which will have an impact on investment, uh, and all that is very important. But where it gets interesting, I think, and where there are analogies, is that uh, a lot of places where uh, natural gas plays are being uh, brought to fruition, they're faced with the fact that they can't actually move the product to the marketplace because we don't have pipelines in place. This is also happening in the oil sector, and I don't know if you've been following the extraordinary stories coming out of, of the Dakotas and elsewhere, uh, where they're transporting oil on trains and they're having difficulties with explosions and other things. I'll tell you one thing that doesn't occur to you necessarily when you read about those explosions uh, and the use of uh, trains for that purpose. Um, I was with a, a a group of people who are important in the agricultural sector. I mean, they're running big farms. They're trying to get their products to, to market. Uh, and in that part of the country, they can't find space on, on freight trains the way they used to be able to because oil uh, is being moved on those same uh, trains. So everything is interconnected and it has an impact. We're going to have to be looking actually uh, at pipelines, uh, transportation, transportation methods uh, to bring uh, oil and gas that is discovered in this country to the marketplace. So that makes the energy field even more challenging. And I dare say if you're in a regulatory position or if you're uh, in a major position uh, in industry, you've got a lot of moving parts. And the most riveting part about it from a strategist's point of view is that you've got to be thinking 15 years out. I mean, it can, take, it can take anywhere between, you know, five to ten years to, to, to site locations for, for pipelines, for electricity transmission. That, it, well, not to mention how long a time, time it takes uh, to build power plants and to get the licenses and to get all of the uh, sign-off from uh, various consumer groups and uh, local regulatory officials and all the way up the food chain. So this is extremely complicated. Um, let me just say one more thing. I know you didn't ask this question, but I'd like to throw it in anyway. <laughs> um, you know, we're not living in an environment that makes it easy to have these debates because we are very short-term in our thinking. And something's got to change about this. This is why I think that if we start thinking about energy as a national security issue, which it is, this will afford us more of an opportunity to think about it as something that requires longer, more strategic approach, because certainly everybody involved in the energy field needs that kind of lead time to think about the right decisions for this country. Thank you. Thank you for uh, being here this evening. Um, the question that I had, I, I really liked how you equated the energy uh, electrical grid with the highway that you're your grandfather uh, did. Um, the, the biggest difference that I see between now and then was 17 to $18 trillion of debt and the lion's share of our federal spending being on right. the mandatory spending right. side and complete paralysis in Washington, D.C. Right. So what do you personally see as the way ahead to achieve that in this environment? Thank you. I mean, you would ask probably one of the toughest questions, uh, especially about the paralysis in Washington. Um, let me just say that I think that there's really good news around the, the energy uh, piece of this. Uh, certainly, we are constrained from a budgetary point of view in ways we were, have never been constrained before. Actually, I think we could say that we came out of World War II with massive debt, but we were in a period of extraordinary growth. So we could, uh, we could mitigate that. And again, I'm proud that the Eisenhower administration played its role in that, as did the Clinton administration, by the way. Um, and so, you know, the, the federal government is naturally going to be constrained. 
Uh, but that doesn't mean that the private sector is going to be, and I think uh, without being an expert in the financing of these projects, uh, I do think that we're going to have to look very hard at and continue to look hard at whether we are uh, creating incentives uh, for the investor community uh, to be uh, undertaking a lot of this modernization themselves. And I think, uh, I think that, well, it's already happening. Uh, but we've got to be always mindful of that because I don't see how really, especially living in Washington and understanding what the culture is like there today, uh, you know, it's the dog that didn't bark, right? It's very hard to make a case for something that miraculously works every day, just kind of despite all the odds. Um, and so we really have to incentivize the investor community. I don't know if any of you realize it's rather extraordinary that when you get your electricity bill, only about uh, um, 11 cents, of, or, sorry, about 11 percent of that um, is um, transmission. Very, very tiny part. Uh, is what you're paying back for these investments in transmission. So, uh, and then, of course, we've got other energy infrastructure, as I was mentioning, too. We've got this change in how we generate electricity. That's going to require big investments, too. Uh, so I do think that the private sector can play a unique role here. Now, with respect to the gridlock, you know, I don't know. I, somehow I think, um, you know, without being... Um, while underscoring uh, the miraculous thing that is our democracy. Um, we all know that uh, the squeaky wheels in our society tend to get the grease, and I think it was at least one president who talked about the silent majority. Um, actually, people are busy getting on with their lives, but we really have to hold our elected officials to a higher standard. We've got to tell them that, uh, you know, we certainly share their frustration, but we're, we're sending them there, A, get this, to pass a budget, um, and then to actually uh, address themselves first to these long poles in the tent. One of the other poles, of course, is our national security, which is our relations with other countries. And then, I don't know, we could have a lively debate about what the third big pole is, but uh, I think I'd put education in there. But uh, um, in any case, um, we're, we're going to have to demand more. And, you know, I, I think that this is something that one reason I love traveling outside of Washington. I have the opportunity to see if I can help light a mini fire under people to say that it really isn't acceptable because there's too much at stake here. And um, I don't think that the United States' leadership position is threatened by any outside country. I think it's threatened by us. It's, it's threatened by our attitude. Oh, well, it all is too hard. Well, it's not too hard. And if we think it's harder today, than it, was, when it, than it was during World War II or the aftermath of either of these wars in the 20th century, we really need to uh, take a history lesson here. This kind of goes in tow with what you were just discussing. A lot of the investor-owned utilities, they do mm -hmm. offer the incentive programs. Mm -hmm. How would you propose, looking at it from a futuristic point of view, that some of the um, participants that consume the electricity that are going for incentives some, sometimes opt out of those programs. How would you suggest to get them back on to the incentive programs to be more energy efficient? Well, you know, um, opting out and cost allocation and all this, this is a, this is a um, very, very important public policy set of issues, uh, but it's, it's very complicated. What I would say that comes immediately to mind for people who are working in this field is I don't think we should ever minimize, ever, uh, the strong feelings of our neighbors who um, come out in opposition to anything, whether it's the building of uh, gas-fired plants, whether it's fracking, whether it's nuclear power plants, whether it's transmission, no matter what it is. Uh, but having said that, I don't think we in this country have made a good enough case about what's at stake. And I have a strong conviction about my neighbors. I think if people understood what's really at stake, you know, they would uh, go along with rational, sensible policies. I really think that. I, you know, you see it time and time again. Um, you go to Nevada, for instance. People in Nevada are really proud that they played a central role during the Cold War because of the Nevada test site, which is right next to Las Vegas. People are proud when they think they're doing something for this country. So I think um, <clears throat> it's... I think really part of the problem is that we're allowing ourselves to think in small units. 
I love communities. Um, I still am very much connected with uh, the town I grew up in, which is Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. I even have a, what I regard as an important position at Gettysburg College. It's such a thrill. But, you know, I see Gettysburg as being part of the state of Pennsylvania, and the state of Pennsylvania as being part of this great country. And we've got to be thinking more um, as a national community uh, so that we can bring not only best practices from what happens locally, and there are a lot of best practices. I've noticed in this state, I've been really impressed by my visit here. We need to hear about your success stories, and we all need to share those. And then we need to think about, um, you know, how we can act as a community in this country. Uh, so that's a really long-winded way of <laughs> trying to address your question, but to get into, you know, the wonky part of that issue, it really rests with a basic truth, uh, which is that we have to understand what's at stake and we have to try and make compromises, but we need to get it done. Ashley, we have a question right here. Bob, right here. Ashley. Thanks so much for your time and for visiting us. Um, I'd be really interested in your views on the role of the military in this long-term transformational change. Um, one of the just examples that comes to mind for me is at the top levels, you've got generals and others saying this is really important, you know, energy security is national security. Um, but then at some of the local levels, you know, at the installation level, um, a lot of times they're not being able to invest in renewable energy because it's not cost effective right now. Right. Whereas it seems like there's a disconnect there between making some of those investments, forming some of those public-private partnerships that could improve infrastructure, um, increase energy security at this local or regional level, um, and investing some of the funds there with a longer-term vision, not just that five-year you know, uh, defense plan outlook that they always have. Well, I think that's a, it's a very, very interesting question. And I can tell you that you're, I mean, I think your assessment is extremely uh, interesting and on target. Um, certainly in Washington, if you talk to the people at the Defense Department and um, uh, at the level where decisions are made, uh, nobody is more conscious um, of energy security. As a matter of fact, some of our most well-known and respected uh, retired uh, generals are working in the uh, energy area. Um, and. Uh, that's very gratifying. They understand a couple of things. From the deployments in Iraq, they understand that it's sure a heck of a lot easier uh, to carry your energy source with you in the form of um, uh, solar gadgets and the rest of it that um, electrify things in the field. Um, I think that they could easily be at the forefront of all kinds of uh, other innovations because uh, having long supply lines uh, is not only hazardous from a military standpoint, it's uh, costly and in many ways inefficient. Uh, and so you have that uh, on the one side. Uh, then, you know, uh, you raise an interesting point that at the local level, I mean, there appears to be a disconnect between the higher level and higher level thinking and lower level. Now, you've got exactly the heart of the point, which is that um, nothing in our environment um, makes it easy to think about longer term questions. And the Defense Department uh, is up against it too because they are subject to budget cuts and budget scrutiny and, and the rest of it. And um, I'm sure that there is more than a little dislocation within the military about how to think about the future, especially with so much changing. I mean, we are um, uh, reducing our footprint uh, in the areas where we have uh, been engaged in war in the last number of years. I don't know what that footprint's going to look like by the time we get done with our current debate. Um, but So, you know, many people think that this will be time to cut back on the military budget, but it's how you cut back on the military budget uh, that is the source of debate in Washington. Now we've got a cyber threat, and it's not just um, the electricity sector. Uh, that's facing this. Uh, you know, many of those targets are potentially, um, you know, military related. The interesting thing is that uh, the military uses electricity for their computers and the rest of it. That's why it really is a national security uh, issue to grid. So um, I think, again, in a budget constrained time, all we can do is begin to, you know, talk about um, the importance of making this long term transformation. And if you've got congressmen or senators, who sit on requisite committees 
that have oversight for how um, these funding decisions are made. Uh, I think there's a lot to be said for beginning to help people understand that there's a difference in the way you spend money between consuming things and investing for the long, long haul. Um, I wish I had a, um, a policy um, prescription for that particular one, but at least it's a big thing that at the very top, where the decisions are finally going to be made, there is a recognition uh, that transforming in the energy sector is, is uh, vital for uh, the military's mission.